hello, everybody. I'm Roger Waldinger. I'm professor of sociology at UCLA, director of the Center for the Study of International Migration. And I am delighted to welcome you to today's event, which is the last in a series that we have conducted throughout the academic year. And we've done so uh, in conjunction with our colleagues and friends at the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego. Uh, I want to thank all of you who have been with us for most of all of the year. This was obviously an adventure in uncharted territory. We had no idea how it would work out, but uh, having uh, been with you for 30 weeks, our sense is that this has been a great success. We've uh, attracted a large and consistent and diverse audience, and we think we've engaged, we've, lit, we've discussed works of very great interest, and, and we have felt that the discussion has consistently been stimulating and uh, enjoyable. Now, today is a is a is a special event uh, and uh, a, a way uh, to uh, I suppose in way uh, motivated by some selfish considerations of my own, my own namely to celebrate the achievements of uh, uh, graduates of our own sociology uh, department uh, uh, doing so uh, by uh, discussing five terrific books that have appeared over the past year 18 months uh, with comments from two of our very distinguished graduates of our program. And it's a particular pleasure for me since I uh, can say that I knew all of the participants of these in this today's panel way back when and, and uh, saw these projects begin uh, at the, the, the point when they were just uh, a, a relatively vague idea. So today, let me, let me first begin by introducing uh, the speakers. Uh, the, and I'll, I'll do so in, in the order of the presentation. I should say that we, we divide the program up into two halves because we have five books to discuss. So that we'll, we'll discuss, we'll hear from three authors and then a comment from David Fitzgerald. We'll, we'll then pause for a brief inter, uh, exchange with the audience and then we'll return to hear from two other authors with a comment by Jane. So uh, let me introduce first uh, Laura Enriquez, who is the author of uh, of Love and Papers, How Immigration Policy Affects Romance and Family. Uh, Laura, you want to raise your hand so everyone can see. Uh, um, Rocio Rosales, who is the author of Fruteros, Street Vending, Illegality and Ethnic Community in Los Angeles. And then David Trui, football in the, author of Football in the Park, Immigrant Soccer, and the Creation of Social Time. So those are the first three books that will be discussed and there'll be a comment by David Fitzgerald. And then we will segue to Tassim Shams, who is the author of Here, There, and Elsewhere, The Making of Immigrant Identities in the Globalized World. And last but not least, Eli Wilson, author of Front of the House, Back of the House, Race and Inequality in the Lives of Restaurant Workers, with a comment from J.M. Kim. So uh, each, each author will talk for roughly 10 minutes. There'll be a comment of 10 minutes. I will be a vigilant timekeeper. Uh, we'll pause then and exchange ideas with the audience. People can send their questions in via chat or raising your hand. And then we'll segue to the second set of books. And then we'll open up for replies from uh, the authors as well as for the comments from the audience. So without any further ado, Laura, the floor is yours. Great, thank you all for um, being here and for Roger for pulling this panel together. I'm um, excited to talk about my book, um, which came out right when this started. I know I got it right when I did some panic shopping, getting ready for the, <laughs> this pandemic to hit and came home to find my book um, very wet on my doorstep. Um, so it's it's great to be able to talk about it um, and to think about, you know, um, yeah, um, interacting with people about it, even if it's still over Zoom. Um, so uh, my book, A Love and Papers, How Immigration Policy Affects Romance and Family, um, examines how illegality functions as a source of lasting social inequality that fuels the continued exclusion of Latino families over generations. So I draw on interviews with 1.5 generation undocumented young adults um, and tracing their transitions through dating, marriage, and parenting, really to show how policies shape who they date and if and how they advance relationships. Um, but also how they perform their roles as parents and partners. So I draw on um, as well, follow-up interviews as well, conducted two years after DACA's implementation, as well as 31 interviews with formerly undocumented young adults who have recently legalized their status, mostly through marriage, um, really to document how the imprint of illegality remains even among tra transitioning to these legal or liminally legal statuses. 
And then finally, I include interviews with um, 39 mostly citizen romantic partners of participants to explore how migration policy is also constrained the everyday lives and upward mobility of these um, US citizens. So to give you a sense of the book, I wanted to share three stories that I present in the opening pages um, to exemplify the ways that immigration policies disrupt family formation. Okay, so, um, so Daniel um, really talked a lot about how his immigration status made it difficult for him to date, right? So Daniel talks about not having a car to pick up his date um, because he refused to risk driving without a license. Um, and that also going out was often beyond his means because he was working a minimum wage job at a fast food restaurant that he really hated and so only worked the minimum amount of hours he needed to sort of maintain, um, you know, the, the, the minimum rather than working extra. Um, when he did go out, he had to show his Mexican passport to buy a beer, um, revealing his undocumented status to those around him. Um, so he feared that um, another girlfriend would think that he wasn't good enough. And he talked a lot about past romantic relationships in which he had been broken up with precisely because of these reasons. I'm not being able to pick his date up, um, not, not wanting to go out to places where he might be rejected, um, not having money to pay for the dates and things like that. Um, right. So really with his example, we can see that the status is creating structural barriers to his everyday life, um, constraining his romantic choices. Um, but also fueling these emotional insecurities that are creating long-term consequences for his ability to establish a family, right? Because if he's not dating, then how is that sort of going to progress? In a second example, we have Regina who talks about how her immigration status affected um, many aspects of her marriage. And one in particular um, instance, she talked about um, her engagement party um, where they were, she was celebrating her engagement and her, um, her upcoming wedding um, to a US citizen partner and a close friend sort of asked her jokingly, cut the bullshit and just tell us the truth. Are you getting married to fix your papers? Um, right? And this really set the tone for her wedding and um, her subsequent marriage, even though at the time she believed that she was ineligible to adjust her status through marriage. Um, and really um, and kind of pushed her to pull away from her friendship networks, become more socially isolated, um, question decisions that she was making, um, and, and her relationship with her partner. Um, and even though she eventually was able to legalize her status, these experiences um, going through the legalization process actually shaded much of her early marriage experiences and her subsequent relationship to her partner. And then finally, we have Luis, who was in his early 30s um, and holding his toddler daughter um, through the, the most of the interview um, and talking about um, his feelings about being a, whether he was not a good father or not, right? I'm um, talking about how he had delayed having children um, beyond the time that he wanted to because he feared separation through deportation, that he felt guilty for not being able to provide his daughter. He talked a lot about being feeling like he was a bad father. Um, that, that his daughter was being punished and he felt that it was his fault um, because who he was um, rather than, you know, sort of placing on society and immigration policy. Um, and so really what we can see is these sort of feelings about his inability to be a good father, um, especially because he couldn't provide for her in the ways that he wanted to and other people expected him to, and also worrying about how his status would harm her as she got older. And I saw this also in sort of um, parents with older children not being able to provide for them in the ways that they wanted. Um, so these stories really illustrate how immigration policies creep into these more personal and private corners of people's lives um, in ways that um, ways that we might expect or at least hope would get better um, with more inclusionary immigration policies. And DACA really offers an opportunity to sort of test that and look into that more um, because um, Daniel and Luis both applied for and received DACA early on in the program and Regina was able to become a lawful permanent resident and eventually a citizen through marriage. But unfortunately, what the second wave of interviews uncovers is that there are these pers persisting consequences of undocumented status, despite transitions to liminally legal or legal statuses. Um, so Daniel um, talks about um, having DACA benefits, becoming um, transitioning into a better job, earning a more stable income that he could spend on dates and non-necessities. Um, having a California ID and beginning to learn how to drive for the first time, you know, in his late twenties. Um, because now he wasn't af afraid of, um, you know, had the money to buy a car, um, but also wasn't afraid of the, the, the financial and deportation consequences of driving without a license. 
Um, but his previous experiences with rejection had um, kept him from committing to a serious relationship um, for over two years. And he felt really left behind as he watched friends um, have babies, get married, get engaged, um, and really, um, really tackling this idea of being excluded for over a decade in young adulthood, um, really um, internalizing these feelings about being an undesirable partner and that continuing to hold him back. Um, Regina also talks about um, having to, to um, despite legalizing her status through marriage, having to uh, go through that process forced her to, to, uh, to, to, to navigate the state, right? So having to follow her husband to the East Coast, leaving college to do that, eventually re-enrolling in college, um, but not being able to engage in uh, internships out of the place where they had moved to or other kinds of things because they were trying to maintain a, a joint household in the case that their immigration um, case was, was investigated, right? So this really influenced her subsequent educational and career decisions. Um, as well as her social decisions sort of moving forward and having to forego these opportunities. Um, and then in Luis's case, we see that past barriers reemerge as he realizes he has limited professional skills because he spent so many years um, outside of a professional environment, even though he has a college degree. Um, so in his, his shift to try and um, take on a salaried position at a nonprofit was very difficult for him. Um, even though he was able to sort of provide for his daughters better, um, still worrying about what's gonna happen in the future. Um, and him and his wife both talked about um, what would come, what if this is sort of, this rug is pulled out from underneath him and his family, which is what we've seen happen in these past couple of years. Um, so these interviews sort of collectively uncover the persisting consequences of undocumented status despite transitions into more liminal or legal statuses. So these three stories illustrate my main argument that immigration policies cultivate enduring consequences for undocumented young adults and their families. Um, and identi I identify three mechanisms through which immigration policies, everyday consequences are transformed into these enduring inequalities. Right, so first, um, that le illegality limits the material resources available to build and sustain families, um, specifically that immigration policies are constraining their everyday choices um, and limiting undocumented young adults' ability to meet their own and others' expectations, ultimately compromising their ability to form the families that they desire. And these seemingly innocuous decisions about where to go on a date, choosing not to go out because of not having enough money or being denied at a bar, or concerns about driving, are really shaped by immigration status. And these are really accumulating over time to determine if and how relationships proceed. And importantly, I show that this process is deeply gendered, right? So Daniel and Luis provide good examples of how men's gendered provider expectations compromise their ability to negotiate limited financial resources because they're expected um, to drive, to pay, to, to take care of their children and their, and their partners. Um, and really these gendered expectations are influencing when and where and how undocumented young men and women are differently experiencing and negotiating illegality. Uh, second, I show that in addition to sort of these enduring consequences throughout an individual immigrant's life, we see that illegality's consequences can stretch over generations. And this really emerges in, convert, in, in thinking about the, the experiences of citizen partners and children who are also constrained as they share in fears of deportation, low socioeconomic status, and are self-regulating their movement and social participation. And many are also adopting strategies to mediate these shared consequences. Um, by trying to help their undocumented partners and parents. And then third, I look sort of longitudinally, right, at individuals who receive DACA or legalized immigration status, um, really documenting the remnants of illegality, even as immigration policies are changing or individuals are transitioning to more secure statuses, right? So what, are, what I kind of show is that this sort of steady march of time is pulling undocumented young adults along the life course and setting up consequences that outlast undocumented status. So they made or avoided making decisions which permanently structured their family formation process. And the timing of the socio-legal changes, right, when they get DACA or when they get permanent residency, um, if these align with the timing of expected family formations um, and transitions, then that really determines the extent to which undocumented young adults are seeing these enduring consequences. But if they're able to make these transitions, then they sort of see less enduring consequences. 
So together, these three mechanisms are really ensuring that the effects of immigration policies endure and contribute to persistent marginalization, particularly within the Latinx community where there are a large number of undocumented immigrants. I'll we'll stop there. All right. Great. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rosie. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Roger, for um, organizing this and bringing us all back together. Um, my book, uh, Fruteros, is an ethnography of a community of fruit vendors in uh, Los Angeles. Um, the presence of fruteros on street corners throughout Los Angeles represents a confluence of larger social and economic forces. Fruteros are labor migrants who have crossed international borders in search of improved economic opportunities, but because most of them are undocumented, they confront obstacles that prevent them from legally participating in the formal economy. Now, I wouldn't be a good ethnographer if I didn't regale you with one of the first stories or um, interactions that I had with a vendor on a street corner. And this uh, really opens the, the, the book um, for readers. Jesus was the first frutero that I visited regularly and befriended. He was clearly perplexed at my presence in the beginning. I asked too many questions and stood too close to him because his infrequent and soft-spoken responses were barely audible above the constant din of street, street traffic. He was 21 years old when I met him in 2006. He was slender, dark-skinned, and had a wispy-haired mustache and goatee. One of the very first conversations that we had went like this. I asked him, do you work every day? He said, I keep bank hours. He laughed at my puzzled face. With his knife, he gestured towards the bank that he was standing in front of and said that he worked six days a week, reduced hours on Saturday, and was closed on Sunday. A few days, a few couple, uh, months after visiting him regularly, I went to his street corner and didn't find him. Along the curb next to the sidewalk where he normally parked his push cart, I saw a melting pile of crushed ice. Had I just missed him? It was a Salvadoran parking lot attendant who answered all of my pressing questions. The health department had done a sweep. They had dumped Jesus's produce into large trash bags. And before taking the push cart, they had asked him to dump all of the remaining ice onto the sidewalk. Did they arrest him, I asked, thinking immediately that it could be related to immigration and customs enforcement. I was told that Jesus had been given a ticket and had been picked up by some of his friends immediately after. I don't understand, I said, trying to make sense of all the details. The attendant shrugged and said bluntly, it is illegal to be a street vendor. At that point, I had no sense of how crackdowns were or how often they occurred. I was immediately full of questions. But the questions that I had that day only scratched the surface of a complicated relationship that street vendors had with the city. Yet throughout my time in the field, what proved more interesting was a Baisano network that helped fruit vendors withstand this and other assaults on their economic and social well-being. And it was a complicated web of relationships within, within that Baisano or compatriot network that really captured my sociological attention. So even though a fruit vendor works alone on a street corner, he is part of a large network of fruteros who are also his paisanos. And in this way, he is not alone. Now here's a mapping of all the vendors that I followed across the years um, doing my field work. One thing that you might notice is that a large a majority of the vendors are from the town of Los Mundos um, in the Mexican state of Puebla. That, uh, was unexpected and proved really interesting in assessing how social networks work. In the bottom right-hand corner, you'll also see Gerardo, who was a labor recruiter and coyote, and he was central to this concentration of fruit vendors from this small town of Puebla. Not only did he help recruit and transport immigrants from Dos Mundos to LA, his family connections in Los Angeles ensured that these young men, upon arrival, would have jobs within the fruit vending um, market. Now, street vending has a long history uh, among recently arrived immigrants. In our collective imagination, we might think of turn of the century in New York when we think of immigrant street peddlers. To be sure, street vendors are a sizable presence in New York today. But whereas New York has 20,000 street vendors selling food, flowers, books, and art, as well as other products, in Los Angeles, there are an estimated 50,000 street vendors of which 10,000 sell food products. And these significant numbers, um, 
should not obscure an important characteristic that made Los Angeles distinct from New York City. That is, that throughout my time in the field, Los Angeles was the largest American city that prohibited street vending. And this prohibition often resulted in the confiscation of product, push carts, fines and citations, and at times arrest. And street vendors were subject to scrutiny, citation, and arrest based on laws and regulations from various city, county, and state agencies. Enforcement was routinely carried out by the police department, the Department of Public Works, and the, and the LA County Department of Public Health. Many vendors were also undocumented and were the subject to federal immigration laws that prohibited their presence in the country. Now, throughout my time in the field, it was not uncommon to hear of vendors working on street corners just days after arriving in the country. At the end of the workday, as I rode around town in a pickup truck with Cristian and Carmen while hauling pushcarts back to the storage commissary, they would honk and nod to their fellow fruteros working on street corners. Carmen always followed each encounter with a quick description for me. That guy works for Raul. He's been here for, for a few weeks. That one doesn't know how to hold a knife yet. He's new. And most often, he just got here. He's from Dos Mundos, too. Dos Mundos was uh, Cristian's hometown. Although I did not select this population of workers, knowing there would be such recent arrivals and in an occupation of heavily networked paisanos, these characteristics proved to be important when scrutinizing the impact of social networks. Now, I gained entree into this world by visiting, slowly visiting individual vendors working in distinct neighborhoods throughout the city between 2006 and 2012. And I remain in contact with many of them via text and social media today. Throughout the years, I did 22 in-depth interviews that I repeatedly, you know, these 22 pe people that I, I repeatedly went back to and continued questioning uh, during long, hour-long sessions. The more, majority of the fruit vendors that I approached were young Spanish speaking Latino men because this demographic was overrepresented among fruteros. They were also primarily from the small town, Dos Mundos, in Puebla. Now, throughout the six years in the field, I interviewed other individuals who touched upon the lives of vendors. I interviewed the owner of the wholesale fruit market where, where vendors shopped and found that she was also from Puebla. And then later in my field, uh, um, in my research, I visited Mexico City in Dos Mundos in 2011 and 2017 to interview fruit vendors who had returned to Mexico, as well as the families that they left behind. My book focuses on these immigrant fruteros and tells a story of ethnic community in challenging times. It is an account of their lives as migrants, as workers, and as members of an ethnic community. And it is a story about immigrant adaptation among entrepreneurial newcomers in a hostile context of reception. Even though we don't typically think of Los Angeles as hostile because we consider it a sanctuary city, we don't often take into account how local laws impact immigrants, especially when those local laws are anti-poverty policing laws. Now, for these vendors, their hometown or paisano ties come to define their work and personal lives in meaningful and powerful ways, but in a way that contradicts how migration scholars have conceptualized immigrant networks. Migration scholars have long documented how newcomers lean on their community of paisanos for assistance upon arrival. And immigrant social networks and the social capital that they provide to their members are important sources of support. Yet the positive functions of immigrant social networks, uh, especially among newly arrived immigrants have received much scholarly attention. In my work, however, I move beyond how immigrants get jobs using their networks and instead focus on how those social networks both build and bind the Paisano community thereafter. My book functions as a critique, critique of previous conceptualizations of, of social networks that are only positive. And I do this because a focus on positive functions of networks can flatten complex narratives and obscure the exploitative undercurrents that can also constitute it. Relationships between people are complicated and dynamic. And in my book, I argue that it's unrealistic to assume that ties between individuals offer only benefits, especially when vulnerabilities related to context of reception, immigration status, class, and gender are present. In my work, I conceptualize the ethnic cage to make sense of both the benefits and detriments of social networks and social capital. For some, the ethnic cage is large, invisible, and functions to corral community while keeping threats at bay. For others, the ethnic cage is small, visible, and functions to confine the individual while that same community does harm. Yet as I showed throughout my book, the ethnic cage can serve different functions at different times for the same individual because personal, social, and work relationships are dynamic. 
The Mexican immigrants in my study open doors to newcomers, both to offer help and to exploit. And this is the ethnic cage. Newcomers are not turned away. Their paisanaje grants them entry, but it does not guarantee benevolence. Like others before me who stumbled on unsavory aspects of immigrant lives, this is not the story that I set out to record. Fieldwork across the years revealed how structural hardship inspired ingenuity among fruteros, but this ingenuity often helped and harmed fellow paisanos. And across the years, I saw both the promise and pain of community. So I hope this piqued your interest in the book. Thank you very much. Okay, terrific. And now we will turn to David Trui, the author of Football in the Park. Thank you. Um, let me get this out of the way here. Okay, uh, so I've been uh, looking forward to uh, this moment for a long time, uh, probably too long. <laughs> and uh, But uh, like my former uh, classmates on this panel, this project began in Haynes Hall, and I couldn't have asked for a better place to launch a study on migration than UCLA. Uh, I have fond memories of my time in graduate school, and I'm grateful for the support and guidance I received from so many people, especially Roger Waldinger, whose sincere enthusiasm and belief in what I was up to pushed me forward as others understandably uh, questioned what I was uh, doing playing soccer and drinking uh, beer all day in the park. Uh, so it really is a tremendous honor and privilege and pleasure to be here with you all, even if virtually celebrating these wonderful books on the diversity and complexity of immigrant experiences in Los Angeles and beyond. I'd like to begin my discussion of football in the park by showing a brief video of park life. One of the men in the book texted me a few years after I left Los Angeles. For my book attempts to capture the camaraderie, creativity, and coordination revealed in this video that is often missing from migration studies. From the video still, you begin to get a sense of what this world was all about, playing soccer and drinking beer. But with time, I saw how both activities were more about being together in a way that resonated with the men's interests and biographies and aligned with the rest of their lives. And it was through these mundane, at times invigorating and joyful interactions that they built relationships, gained recognition, and exchanged resources. But so much more is revealed when we press play. <laughs> Vamos en taco. All right, so although some of the details are hidden from you, I'm guessing from the smiles I can make out over Zoom that this scene feels fun and entertaining. You might also sense how the men make their interactions dramatic and meaningful through their exuberant displays and playful taunts. Indeed, the book's central argument is that fun with others, what sociologists refer to as sociability, is not automatic but takes work and collaboration. What you watched was an achievement or accomplishment built on group history and the demands of the situation. For example, there's the ritual of playing soccer and gathering afterwards to socialize and drink beer. And the park provides a space to do this, although it's far from neutral or trouble free, as the men's time there sometimes created conflict with neighbors, police and family members. The park draws a revolving cast of characters that energize the proceedings. In this case, two cherished park uh, regulars juggling the ball, beers in hand to the delight of onlookers eager to applaud and berate. You also see how the men draw from a local history to spice up the fun. Namely, Polo, who started his declining form, and Ivan's ascendancy to galactico status. The men's confidence and creativity also come alive, be it Ivan's playful Cientacos nickname or Polo's willingness to play the fool. Taken together, the video provides a peek into the men's complex humanity, contrary to more one-dimensional portraits of Latino immigrant men that saturate the airwaves. Watching the video transports me back to the park and similar scenes I tried to capture in my book. I'd like, I'd, sorry, I'd now like to share two photographs that are not in the book. Football in the Park captures a moment in time and one filtered by my own biases and experiences in the park. Furthermore, social worlds are never static, but constantly evolving. 
Someone I met at a previous book talk sent me a wonderful photo from his time at Mar Vista, the park I studied, while he was a graduate student at UCLA in the 1990s, well before I initiated this project. The photo captures a recognizable scene from the park, a group of men cheerfully posing on a picnic table before or after a game of soccer. I believe I know some of the men in the photo and heard many stories of park life from this period, but the meaning and history of this particular moment in time is unknown to me. I imagine many of you have your own photos and rich memories of playing and socializing in parks as well. Indeed, that is the promise and potential, a possibility of informal play in public space, which you might have rediscovered during the pandemic. Football in the Park is my attempt to capture the meaning, organization, and history of this familiar global scene that many people only glimpse from afar through the prism of narrow stereotypes. In fact, outsiders tended to perceive and represent the situation on and off the Mar Vista soccer field as unruly, even dangerous. The second photo celebrates the culmination of a project that began in January 2008. In mid-January of this year, when the book came out, Polo texted me a photo, this photo of him holding my book with a group of guys standing in the very same parking lot as the previous photo. Seeing my book out in the world in Polo's hands warms my heart, for my book aimed to honor how Polo and the other jugadores del parque imbue their lives with meaning by coming together to play soccer and socialize in a public park. For the men I describe in my book are not one-dimensional caricatures deserving sympathy or scorn, but people living full and complex lives in the challenging circumstances. Indeed, while it was neighborhood grievances that had originally drawn me to the park, it was the soccer players themselves who captured my attention and who deserved to be brought out of the shadows. Let me conclude with a few lessons learned. First, in, treat informal, informal play in all its wholesome, obscene forms as important in its own right, rather than frivolous, beyond the pale, or proxies for something else. I came to this project in part because there had been so little written about Latino men playing soccer in public parts, parks despite its ubiquity in cities small and large. I believe my book sheds light on the inner workings of this familiar scene while also speaking to other issues such as network formation and immigrant reception. Second, I urge you to situate worlds of play within the context of the participants' histories and everyday lives. It took time and patience, but I gained greater insight in what, into what I was observing at the park by going beyond its boundaries. So to my surprise, I saw how the park emerges the safest and most respectable place to drink beer and occasionally fight, which revealed underlying structural inequalities. And by following the men at work, I saw how they were welcomed as workers in ways they weren't always as people in the park. A different book would have explored in greater detail how park life connected to the men's family and home lives. Third, while surveys and interviews can reveal a lot, these more distance and short-term approaches miss what only deep long-term engagement can uncover. By spending years in the park and shadowing these men elsewhere, I saw how friendships faded and flourished, newcomers transformed into regulars, events lived on in story form, and routines changed and solidified over time, all of which I've tried to capture in my book. Thank you uh, for listening. I welcome your thoughts and questions. Hey, terrific. And now we segue to David Fitzgerald for a comment. Thank you, Roger. You know, I was just uh, scrolling through the list of participants on this Zoom, and it is truly a privilege to be part of this community of scholars, the, the people on the panel, as well as those who are joining us um, virtually, and to have the chance to celebrate the achievement of friends and colleagues um, who have also called UCLA home. The three books that have been assigned to me hang together exceptionally well. They're all based on everyday life of mostly working class Latino immigrants in contemporary LA. They're all based on participant observation and qualitative interviews. The description is thick. The hidden social processes are laid plain and the personal portraits deeply humanistic. As a reader, I felt like I was on the scene and I knew the people there. In fact, it was, it was good to see old friends from the book just now in the video clip. There's a lot to learn from and engage in praising these books, but for the purposes of today's discussion, I want to focus on three common themes around migration that cut across all of the books. And those are legality, 
networks and the macro context of shifting migration patterns that shape local integration in LA. I'll start with uh, Rocio's book, Fruteros, which we should mention, just won the honorable mention in the ASA International Migration Section Book Award. She'll be honored at the August ASA, so congratulations, uh, Rocio, for that. The main contribution here is around what migrant networks do. And as you just saw, she introduces the concept of an ethnic cage. Uh, the cage includes elements of a protective barrier, like a shark cage that protects the diver inside, but the metaphor is mostly negative. Uh, her work explains the mechanism linking initial mobility followed by a network trap. As migrants from a small town in the Mexican interior, effectively called uh, Dos Mundos, rely on their social networks to migrate to LA. Pioneer migrants who have gone before them finance the journey of their paisanos and provide newcomers with lodging, information about how to find their way in the metropolis, and jobs, as pioneers are the owners of the pushcarts, which they hire new migrants to operate. But the same pioneers then exploit their workers by withholding wages, by encouraging employees, who often are also their renters, to follow into this downward spiral of indebtedness uh, in which their late rent payments are, are linked to their employment and lower wages, all kinds of forms of, of abuse. So in many settings, that kind of situation would not be infinitely reproduced because words of the misdeeds would spread throughout the social networks and that would cut off a source of new workers. But in this case, the migrant workers do not share this critical information about abuses with their friends and family back in Mexico. And they have a good reason for that. The migrants who have suffered a lot of hardships want to appear to have been successful on their migration to the States. Their effort to maintain their prestige in the home community in Mexico, uh, a status that has been taken from them in Los Angeles, lends them to uh, a situation of censoring this highly relevant information. So the networks are maintained, but the quality of the information flowing through them becomes degraded over time. New migrants use those networks to get to LA and the cycle is perpetuated. So Rocio puts the entire story together by showing the causes, the effects, the intervening mechanisms all the way across the migration circuit. Her multi-sided fieldwork reveals the missing pieces of the story that would have been lost by focusing exclusively on LA or only on Dos Mundos. The book emphasizes, emphasizes um, an ethnic cage, but it seems to me like it's an ethno-legal newcomer cage. To push the concept forward, I would invite further consideration of what the Fruteros are a case of. The context is marked by a new migration network. Dos Mundos is in its first generation of out migration with potentially lower levels in, of information to potential migrants about the conditions that they can expect in the US. Uh, relatedly, very few people in the network enjoy legal status. This is not a multi-generation community of migration where many people were able to take advantage of the Erica legalization, for example, this is overwhelmingly a first generation dominated by unauthorized migrant network. And its immigrants occupy this marginally illegal business niche because of all kinds of licensing and other problems. So all of those factors makes these migrant workers exceptionally vulnerable to exploitation. And this is not a comparative study, uh, nor does it need to be. But my main question is how transportable are the lessons in this study to cases of older migration circuits uh, with a higher prevalence of authorized status and people who are engaged in more fully legal um, economic niches. Let's turn to David's uh, book on uh, football in the park. The main contribution here is the idea of social tying. Rather than assuming social ties as an existing social fact, the book shows the process of network formation. And specifically, it shows how trust is created through repeat interactions in these recreational spaces that we just saw that include sharing information about job opportunities. And all of this happens despite the lack of a residential enclave or a business enclave, and in situations where the hometown of origin is irrelevant. So the way the study moves beyond the hometown was especially intriguing to me. As someone who's lived in migrant hometowns in Mexico, I see the world through hometown lenses. 
because of that, I see hometown connections on every corner and today's event seems like a hometown association of UCLA event, in fact. I've been to a number of soccer games in Southern California in parks that look like the one that David shows. They're all fielding hometown-based teams. That's why I was there. And the hometowns in Mexico where I work publicly display trophies from their soccer teams in Chicago and California. But even when I had more hair 20 years ago, the hometown soccer clubs were already becoming mixed. They included players that had been met through work, or from living in the same apartment complex, met on the field, various other places outside of a strictly hometown connection. So a question for both Rocio and David is, how do we get from Rocio's hometown-centric network story to David's LA-centric story? What's happening between these accounts? Exactly why are these hometown ties unraveling, at least for the men in the park, who, at least in the broader sociability phase of the day, are inhabiting a pan-ethnic Latino space comprised of people from many hometowns and many national origins within Latin America. It's a chance to look not just at network formation, but at restructuring. And that endeavor would seem like it's very much in keeping with David's broader project of looking at social tying as a dynamic process by including social untying. Another point of dialogue with Rocio's work is to ask, to what extent is the park a cage? One difference between the occupational niches of the contractors in the park and the frutero business is the nature of the clients. The fruteros might have repeat customers who come out of their offices to buy fruit every day, but each of the transactions is discrete and it's paid in full at the end of the interaction. The fruteros really don't need to develop deep relationships with customers for their business to work. By contrast, for the contractors in the park, a successful business is predicated on repeat interactions with clients based on very ambiguous reciprocation over long time periods, years. So these qualities of interaction between the contractors and the clients then carry over into relations among the contractors in the park because they're sharing information about job opportunities, but they're also hiring each other as subcontractors. They're recommending reliable contractors to their clients. The mutual advantages of trust in these repeated exchanges among contractors that lack a clear mechanism for settling up debts at the end of the day means their long-term interests become much more aligned with each other over time. So this alignment contrasts with that of the fruteros where the cart owners have an incentive to exploit their workers to the hilt. It's another reason to wonder if in a different kind of economic sector, these hometown networks might be much less exploitative. Back to David's book, it doesn't dwell on questions of legal status, in part for the understandable reason that it uses real nicknames, photographs, and an actual place name that's identifiable. But what are the broader social conditions that produce these intense interactions and the long hours of socializing there? does not the park loom so large in the lives of many regulars in part because of the indirect effects of unauthorized status. There's a revealing contrast reported at one point between the older players who hang out at the park long after the game is over and the younger generation born in LA who would be US citizens who are more likely to come and just play soccer and then leave. The book points out that there are other potential drinking spaces but they could lead to getting into more serious trouble with the police and a heightened risk of deportation. The economic constraints of an authorized status means that the men are less able to afford more expensive recreational activities, including league soccer. The job information that's usually exchanged in these spaces is of a particular type. It's usually restricted to off the books kinds of work that doesn't require legal papers. So I wonder if Robert Putnam, would be thrilled or depressed with this book. His seminal work on Italy championed soccer clubs as backbones of democracy. And then his later work bemoans that Americans bowl alone because it undermines civic engagement. It's ironic that the thick multiplex ties formed in the soccer park are produced by exclusion from political membership rather than being the condition for its full fruition. 
Let me turn now to Laura's work on Of Love and Papers, which is just exceptionally illuminating and truly heartbreaking also in, in many places. The main takeaway here is a deep understanding of how legal status, particularly unauthorized status, impinges on but doesn't prevent romantic relationships across status with negative spillover effects into many domains of social life and even across generations. So like David's work on networks, the study does not assume an immigrant family as a starting point, but rather it's present at their attempted creation. The text makes the question of illegality central as Laura just described a few moments ago. So my first question is, what are the broader patterns of Mexican migration to the US that are producing the conditions for those extensive cross-border unions? And I think there are several factors worth considering. First is the large absolute and relative size of the unauthorized population, which means that there are extensive exposure opportunities and a lack of stigma around the status because it's so common. Next, there's the long duration of most unauthorized migrants residents in the US now. About two thirds of that population has been in the US for at least 10 years. And that figure is even higher for people of, of Mexican birth. And then we're in an age of extensive border enforcement that makes returning to the hometown in Mexico to look for a spouse the way that someone's uh, forebears might have done now quite expensive and dangerous for getting back into the US. Like football in the park, but unlike Fruteros, a love and papers tells a US centric story. I bring that up because ethnographic work going back at least to the 1970s and Mexican communities of migrant origin shows that returning migrants with US legal status, citizenship or a green card, often were able to convert that into improved prospects in local marriage markets compared to their peers. So the second question is, what's the articulation between that more instrumental valuation of legal status, at least as it's been reported in this older sending community literature, with the contemporary interviewees general rejection of a utilitarian motivation for marrying someone with papers or US citizenship. Finally, reading across the authors, did Rocio and David's informants, which were you know, observed in this ethnographic context um, in an overwhelmingly male setting, did they develop cross-status romantic relationships? What were their exposure opportunities, their experiences, and, and how did they interpret it? I had many other reactions, uh, but for now, I simply want to thank each of the authors, as well as Roger, uh, many of the other faculty advisors who are on the Zoom, uh, for the years of work that have produced these three outstanding books. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Thank you, David, for such a wonderful comment that both told uh, the audience more about the books, uh, but also raised a series of appreciative yet critical and probing comments. So what I'd like to do is uh, engage in dialogue briefly with the with the audience. Uh, and what I can do is allow people who have sent me questions, raise the hands to ask a question. So uh, I'm going to uh, Ruben Hernandez Leon has a question, and let me give him, let him talk. Ruben? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I just have, you know, questions for each of the uh, three authors. Uh, for Laura, I wrote a question in the, in the chat uh, about um, this concept that uh, Daisy Del Real has developed. Uh, her, uh, Laura's work uh, made me think of it. And I wrote, Laura, your vignettes made, vignettes made me think of the concept of toxic, of toxic ties. I understand that your focus is on the state, but does the concept of toxic ties shed light on the personal relations of young undocumented uh, adults? Should I read the questions for the other guys? Go ahead. Sure, why not? Uh, okay. A question for Rocio. Can you say more about when the ethnic cage works in one direction versus the other? Supported versus explo exploitative is undocumented status a condition? And then for David Truy, uh, what other forms of play and leisure should researchers study to learn more about spaces and mechanisms of integration for migrants or simply to learn about self-realization? What about immigrant women? Thank you. Okay, terrific, thank you. So why don't the, the um, one of the speakers respond to Ruben's question then we'll come back at the end of the se entire session for responses to the commentators. 
So let's go in alphabetical order. So Laura, Rocio, and then David. Um, so I appreciate that question, Ruben. Um, so I do know Daisy's work, obviously, because she's from UCLA too, um, but for folks that don't know, right? So this idea of toxic ties is the idea that documented um, folks sort of abuse, exploit, um, or demean undocumented people, partners, family members, friends, um, but it's really about the relationship across statuses um, and this idea that, the, that there's unequal power relationships, right, within, um, within those, those cross-status relationships. Um, so, so I do find that that uh, tends to be the assumption in looking at cross-status romantic relationships, um, but that's not what I find um, in, in, I would say, the vast majority of these, these experiences. I think there are instances of um, the example with, with um, uh, the, 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 anyway, I think there are instances uh, of this happening, um, but, but it's not usually across status when there's accusations. So in the case of the accusation of you're just marrying for papers, that was, you know, another undocumented person. Um, and I think that that's a different sort of piece. Um, but I would say most relationships are are not toxic ties, they're supportive. And that's part of the reason why the book is called Of Love and Papers, right? That these relationships are of love um, and that the partners are supporting each other. And there's a lot of um, intention around um, using one's um, citizenship status to, to help and support um, and facilitate the navigation um, of their undocumented partners. And I would say the very few cases that I did um, find of sort of, um, abuse or uh, um, uh, intimate partner violence um, were um, not, you couldn't necessarily trace those to um, cross status power differentials. Um, but also in the one case that there was a citizen partner and undocumented partner, um, I'd say it's important to recognize that that was um, not, uh, that gender played a role there. So it was actually undocumented men who had concerns about documented women um, uh, accusing them of, of um, violence and not having um, deportation concerns because of how um, gender and immigration status sort of intersect um, and, and make meaning in the deportation process and regime. Um, so, but that was sort of one, one case out of, you know, 150. Um, so there, there wasn't much, um, much presence of these sort of toxic ties. Okay, terrific, we'll see you. Uh, yeah, so in the book, I detail how um, paisanos from those mundos would often rally when bad things happen. So whether it was a crackdown or an arrest uh, or a death, uh, you know, the it was routine to have colectas or the collection of money to help pay the expenses of, a, of these unintended issues that would arise. And because the whole population, the whole community was very precarious, these uh, colectas would happen Often, So, you know, to answer the question, that's one of the ways that these were supportive networks. But in the book, I also focus an entire chapter on the story of Manuel, who is arrested. And once he's arrested, um, an ice hold is triggered. And so when the word spreads among the Frutero community that Manuel might get deported, everyone kind of descends and begins taking his property, not because they want to help him or I've spent, you know, they they opt to help themselves instead of trying to help Manuel. So the roommates try to confiscate his truck because they're concerned that he's not gonna be around to pay the rent. His workers confiscate the push cars because they wanna keep working another day while he's in jail. And everybody basically decides that if he's gonna be deported and he's lost, everybody else can scramble and get the few resources that he had to save themselves. So this is like the nature of the precarious network, right? They uh, rely on each other when bad things happen. They do these uh, colectas, they spread money um, or they contribute money to people in need. But when bad things befall one of the members, they also trigger all of these processes that prompt uh, an outsider to think that it's you know, um, exploitative or problematic. Um, but both of these scenarios are because the vendors are in a very precarious situation, right? I think they, they have to look out for each other, but they also have to continuously look out for themselves. Um, and this is one of the, the features of the ethnic cage, the, the both the help and the exploitation that is inherent in this. And is undocumented status of condition 
I definitely think that undocumented status structures the ethnic cage um, and a lot of the precarity that the vendors experiences because of the undocumented status and the precarity that comes from that. But I, I do wonder whether the exploitative tendencies are a feature of relying so fully on members of the community, not only for your job, but for your housing, um, for you know, your romantic uh, associations. And so it's, it's interesting, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next generation, because as David noted, this is a snapshot of first generation immigrants very soon after their arrival, who, you know, these, these young men haven't established concrete ties to the country, either through time or through, you know, romantic relationships with others like Laura's um, respondents have. So I think uh, the next generation of migration scholars coming out of UCLA can track the, the fruteros in the second and third generation to see how things change. Okay, terrific. Thank you. David. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Ruben. Uh, first, I would say that uh, play and leisure, you know, should be studied. And uh, I, I don't think there's been enough attention to play and leisure, whether it's soccer or otherwise. Uh, so that would kind of be my first answer that I, you know, I would encourage people to look at this as, as uh, an important source, as you mentioned, of integration, of self-realization, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in terms of, you know, what forms, I mean, I think soccer is, 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 uh, is a big activity in Latino uh, communities and other immigrant populations. But I mean, I'm less, I, less directive in terms of what activities, but giving a greater emphasis kind of on contextualizing um, their organization, their meaning in the particular setting. So I'm now in rural Virginia, where I don't see the same type of pickup scenes here, um, in part because I think Latino immigrants feel a little less safe to kind of hang out in public in this way. And, and as a result, and of course, they have the same love and passion for soccer. And therefore, there's been much more kind of attention and interest in the leagues because there they can have a little more protection by permitting the fields, having more of an organizational structure. Um, so it's the same activity, but in a different context. So I would just kind of encourage to really think about the context of whatever form of play and leisure you're looking at. Um, and finally, in terms of, you know, what about immigrant women? I mean, I think you're asking in terms of their leisure and play practices, uh, same thing. I would encourage people to, uh, to, to study that and pay attention to it. And, um, but also recognizing that there are certain kind of forms of, again, it depending on the situation, the context, et cetera, uh, that women do face, you know, often greater kind of uh, sources of exclusion and challenges in being out in public. So these men were very much stigmatized as Latino, but being a man in public was less of a threat maybe for women in their lives. Um, so obviously this is very much a gendered story uh, in terms of some of the their feelings of comfort in public. Uh, but again, the key point is greater attention to play and leisure I would love to see in migration studies. Okay, terrific. So just before segueing to the second part of the program, I just want to uh, further extend the congratulations that David mentioned. So uh, just this week, the um, International Migration Section of the uh, ASA announced uh, a variety of different awards. Uh, and uh, those awards include, as David mentioned, uh, uh, honorable mention for the best book uh, for Rocio Rosales' book, but also the best book award for uh, uh, Tassim Sham's book, and we'll hear from Tassim in a moment. Uh, in addition, uh, several other people on the call were also awarded. So Peter Catron received the uh, best paper award, Kiara Ghali, honorable mention for the best paper award, and Andrew Lee, the best graduate student award. So this is a terrific uh, opportunity to celebrate the scholarship that has emanated and is continuing to come from this department. Okay, so without further ado, well, I'll turn the floor over to, to Tassin. I, before doing so, I also want to uh, just one additional word of thanks to Jayun, who is joining us from Berlin. So who, who is, it is a late evening for her. And so I'm really appreciative of your willingness to spend this additional time with us. Okay, Tassin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Roger. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Roger and um, David for organizing this lovely and unique um, event. Um, this is uh, definitely a homecoming for me because this is where it all began. 
And uh, this is extra meaningful for me uh, because I get to celebrate my book with my intellectual parents, Roger Waldinger and Ben Hernandez Leon. So many of my uh, UCLA professors and friends, and uh, as they say, members of the UCLA mafia. Uh, thank you, um, Jayan, for uh, reading my book. I look forward to your comments. And uh, most importantly, I want to congratulate Laura Rocio, Eli, and David for your incredible books. I can't wait to teach them um, in my classes. Um, my book here, there, and elsewhere is about how, contrary to common perception, immigrants' identities are shaped by geopolitics, not just in the immigrant sending and receiving countries, but also in those places located beyond the homeland and hostland, places that I conceptualize as elsewhere based on ethnographic data, in-depth interviews, and analysis of social media activities of South Asian Muslim Americans, I introduce a new analytical model for studying immigrant identity formation, the multi-centered relational framework, which can encompass global geopolitics in the immigrant's homeland, hostland, and elsewhere. The book is rooted in my personal story as much as it is embedded in my curiosity as a migration scholar. I am a first generation Bangladeshi immigrant who arrived in the United States with her family as a teenager. But my first introduction to the US was in Mississippi, specifically Hattiesburg, a small predominantly white conservative college town where my parents still live. I was recuperating at my parents' house from a particularly grueling quarter of graduate school at UCLA. I thank my UCLA professors for that when the 2015 Charlie Hebdo attacks took place in Paris. It was of course a horrific event, but I also remember my parents being glued to their TV as they followed the live coverage. Although the attacks had, had, uh, had taken place far away in France and elsewhere that is neither Bangladesh where they are from nor the United States, which they now call home, they still feared a backlash in their small town. Um, they called a handful of other Bangladeshi Muslims, the new in the area, and they learned that they too were fearing a backlash. One of them was a hijabi woman studying to become a doctor, and she had decided, for instance, not to go to the local library the next day to study. Later that year, when ISIS attacked Paris, I was back in LA, but there too, I saw the same kind of fear among the South Asian Muslims I was studying, despite the significantly more cosmopolitan milieu. Um, the common frame of reference that hung over everyone in these communities was 9-11, as if the ISIS terror attacks had happened not far away in France, but here in America. Yes, immigrants do have various global connections that transcend homeland hostland borders. But then how do these places beyond, but in relation to the homeland and hostland also shape immigrants' identities? I could not find an answer to this question in the foundational readings on international migration, which focused largely on the sending and receiving countries. Assimilation theories analyzed how hostland contexts shape immigrants' homeland identities over time. Transnationalism expanded the focus beyond the hostland, but was still bound within the dyadic homeland hostland paradigm. And diaspora showed how members of a dispersed population are linked to a common homeland and to each other but largely overlooked the hostland context. My book extends the migration scholarship by showing how places beyond the homeland and hostland elsewhere shape how immigrants view themselves, that is their self-identification with elsewhere, and how these places shape how others in the hostland view immigrants, identification of immigrants by others in relation to elsewhere. Using data on South Asian Muslim Americans, I show the different dimensions of the immigrants' Muslim identity category, tie them to different elsewhere contexts. As Muslims, these immigrants are members of the Ummah, the imagined worldwide community of Muslims that subsumes borders and connects all Muslims by producing shared beliefs, practices, and a sense of membership. However, the heartland of this imagined community is not found in South Asia, but in the Middle East. As the birthplace of Prophet Muhammad and the location of Islam's holiest sites, the Middle East is arguably the religious and political center of the Muslim world. And as self-identifying Muslims, these immigrants subscribe to the various places, peoples, histories, and conflicts in the Middle East that sustain their Muslim identities. As such, I found many of my participants were politically oriented towards elsewhere Middle Eastern places, such as Palestine, Syria, and Turkey. 
but how the immigrants self-identify does not determine how they are identified by others in the host land. Despite the salience of the Middle East in the participants' self-identification, it is the Muslim-related contexts in Europe that shape how Muslims at large are perceived in America. For example, whereas the 2015 ISIS attacks in Paris had produced Islamophobic backlash in the US, similar attacks in Beirut just one day before the Paris attacks had gone virtually unnoticed. So in these examples, the multi-centered relational framework captures three specific points of focus or centers, thereby expanding that homeland hostland dyad. First, we have the immigrants' homeland, in this case, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. Second, we have the host land, the United States. And third, we have elsewhere. In these examples, elsewhere meaning the Middle East and Europe. The main goal of the multi-centered relational framework is to capture if, how, and when the relationships between which centers become salient and shape the immigrants' worldview and day-to-day -day interactions. But I must uh, emphasize that elsewhere does not mean everywhere. A place located beyond the homeland and hostland by itself is not important to the immigrants' identities. It is only when that place is salient to the homeland society, the hostland society, or the relationship between the two that it becomes an elsewhere. In other words, an elsewhere is a place that is meaningful for not just the immigrants, but also for the people around them, which is why elsewhere affects how immigrants understand their location in both global and hostland social hierarchies. I argue that a place is an elsewhere if the answer is yes to the following questions. Are contexts in a place beyond the homeland and hostland relevant to the immigrant's sense of self? Do those contexts shape how others in the hostland view these immigrants in their day-to-day -day life? Uh, here, there, and elsewhere presents my findings to these questions, as well as the conditions, the parameters, and the generalizability of this elsewhere framework. Since I finished writing this book in late 2019, I think now there is more evidence why we as migration scholars need to locate immigrants' experiences in connection to contexts not just here and there, but also elsewhere. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that what happens in a faraway foreign land does not stop at its borders, but can produce domino effects, whether they are social, political, or epidemiological, forceful enough to lock down the entire world. And we can see more clearly, perhaps than any other time in recent memory, the power of globalization and how it intersects with local forms of boundary work, like race, ethnicity, nationalism, and religion. Um, I look uh, forward to your questions and I look forward to Jayon's comments. Thank you. Okay, terrific, thank you so much. Okay, Eli, the floor is yours. Ah, got it. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Eli Wilson. I'm at the University of New Mexico. And um, as other panelists have done, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be present amongst uh, so many fantastic books. Um, of course, one of my greatest regrets, I will say up front, is that I wish I had engaged with these ideas uh, prior to writing and, and conducting fieldwork, because I think so many, so much of what we've heard today is useful uh, based on what I found in my book. So um, my book came out from NYU Press earlier this year, uh, is titled Front of the House, Back of the House, uh, Race and Inequality in the Lives of Restaurant Workers. And this is a book that is uh, truly born out of a combination of my own personal work experience, as well as my intellectual interests that were rooted in that context. Um, you know, restaurants for me and, and from what I experienced firsthand, uh, are a setting where I knew that so much of sociological interest was uh, going on oftentimes in very messy and complicated uh, interactions. Uh, this was a setting of immigrant labor. It was also a setting of profound race, class, gender, and immigration status distinctions. It was a setting of the production of service and from that sociological, uh, unpacking that sociological perspective. It was also a setting, uh, to echo what David uh, commented just earlier today, it was a setting where labor and leisure were collapsed uh, for many of those involved in restaurant work. Uh, and, you know, so to begin, I thought I would just uh, kind of walk back a little bit and um, I, I think it's necessary to unpack uh, what is this restaurant setting and why is it relevant here in this context? Oh, I'm... Do I click to move forward? There we go. Okay, got it. 
So um, to, to, to go back just a little bit, um, as many of you are well aware, uh, restaurants are a prominent setting for immigrant labor, particularly in a, a global city like Los Angeles, uh, especially, uh, again, in the context of Los Angeles, um, immigrants from Mexico and Central America. At the same time, uh, this is also setting of tremendous uh, sources of social inequality, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about. Um, this is a setting where the social inequality oftentimes functions as business as usual. These are environments where many of us um, you know, sort of circulate within, maybe not necessarily as workers, but certainly as consumers. Uh, and yet um, in our midst, uh, I, I, this book argues, uh, are profound sources of social differentiation and ultimate the, ultimately the reproduction of, um, of key uh, axes of inequality uh, in our society at large. Uh, now, uh, to, to, to speak a little bit about the title of this book, Front of the House, Back of the House, uh, many of you may also be aware, this is a key categorical distinction, organizational distinction in restaurants. Uh, whether you work in the front of the house and back, or the back of the house is tremendously consequential and roughly mirrors the kind of Goffmanian distinction between front stage and backstage. Uh, with one um, major difference, which is that a different uh, kind of cohort of workers operates in these different spheres. And this binary, this, this categorical distinction is, uh, is, is a key distinction within restaurants, not only in terms of your title, but also in terms of how you are afforded different kinds of uh, remuneration um, and different types of uh, structures, uh, the way your employment is structured. Uh, now also key to the story, is as again, many of you may be uh, aware at a basic level, um, the kinds of individuals that work and operate in the front of house uh, in that sphere are oftentimes have um, key distinctions from those in the back of house. In the front of house, particularly in the settings that I engaged with for this study, um, individuals tend to be um, predominantly white. They uh, are of a higher educational background. Uh, they tend to be younger and more conventionally attractive for reasons I'll speak about in uh, just, uh, just, just a minute. Uh, in the back of the house, this is um, you know, classically understood uh, racialized immigrant jobs, uh, what Lisa Cantazarite would call brown collar work. Uh, and these settings, uh, these are uh, primarily individuals working as cooks, dishwashers, uh, and other types of positions who are, uh, the majority are immigrant Latino men, mostly from Mexico and Central America. Now, in terms of economic distinction, just to, uh, just to finish up the sort of the background uh, of the book, um, those in the front of the house, because of access to tips, uh, make a tremendous amount more than those situated in the back of the house. Uh, in my own study and based on my own experience, uh, this economic distinction was somewhere between three to four times the wages, that is, if you are a server or bartender versus a cook or dishwasher. So again, a tremendous difference in terms of the kinds of opportunities uh, that these types of jobs afford. Now, the, the key puzzle to me, um, and this was something I, I learned in the field and, and became a, a, a key kind of, um, you know, a spring from which this project emerged, was what continues to separate and keep uh, these, these um, cohorts of workers separate within workplaces, unable to make mobility jumps back and forth. Uh, restaurants are also service settings that are not closed by formal credentials, as we might imagine in other more uh, professional environments. There are no formal job requirements that are consistent across the industry, preventing somebody who works as, say, a cook or a dishwasher to make slow and incremental um, you know, advancements into either management, such as say chefs and the leaders in the kitchen, or to cross over into the front of the house, particularly if they um, are able to speak English and perform the basic duties of service. Let's see. And so what, what, what this book ends up arguing um, is that the sources of inequality are complex and overlapping that anchor these unequal and divided what I call worlds of work apart. Uh, certainly, management plays a foundational role in producing this inequality, these inequalities specifically of race, class, and gender. 
And they do so through various types of hiring uh, strategies that they're looking for individuals who uh, fit this, these kinds of embodied characteristics. For instance, in the front of the house, looking for traits we associate with whiteness and upper middle class status. Uh, and they follow through further in the restaurant uh, and further within the workplace with supervisory strategies that anchor some of these distinctions uh, and, and treat these cohorts of workers separately. Now, uh, whereas other scholars have unpacked uh, the sort of managerial uh, uh, dimensions in producing inequality in the workplace, uh, less often is the focus how, of how coworkers and the dynamics between workers also end up reinforcing or sometimes exacerbating these same distinctions. So what I found in, on a daily basis is that workers, whether situated in the front and back, would oftentimes uh, operate and, and have relations with one another that were estranged across these key distinctions, uh, these boundaries that I talk about as racialized, class, and gendered boundaries within the workplace. Uh, and they oftentimes had very different relationships to their, very, to their job, whether in the sphere of the front of the house world of work or in the back of house uh, world of work. And so coworkers themselves ended up in, these, in this environment very much structured by management would end up reinforcing these divides that made it incredibly difficult for those situated in the back of the house in these lower status, lower paying jobs to end up uh, making mobility jumps into the front of the house. Uh, again, coworkers themselves ended up closing off these bounded um, and differentiated worlds of work. Now, I thought in my last few minutes, I would speak a little bit more to uh, knowing that we are, uh, this is a migration, international migration focused job, uh, and talk about something that I think has a lot of parallels with what we've already heard from other authors on this panel. Uh, and that is differentiating the experiences between the foreign born generation of workers and the uh, generally LA born second generation uh, Latino workers, mo who, most of whom are men. Now, the first generation experienced things that one migration scholars might predict. Uh, they faced a racialized uh, job ceiling uh, of which they could only ascend uh, to a certain, uh, you know, a, a certain level of jobs and earnings that was certainly below the level of management and, and, um, and authority within this workplace. And oftentimes what they experienced is if, um, if they were subjected to intersecting and cumulative sources of disadvantage, for instance, uh, was uh, unable to speak English, of course, this is a, um, in, in this type of work environment, they were um, undocumented and they were, uh, had low levels of formal education, they were more likely to be trapped in the, what I refer to as the back closet. And that would be the lowest rungs of employment, um, which would be, for instance, various kinds of cleaning positions and dishwashing positions. Uh, to give you an example, I encountered uh, numerous um, individuals who had been dishwashers and those low level positions sometimes for decades on end. So uh, there was certainly a dimension of entrapment within this workplace um, for those individuals. Now, the second generation experienced something a little bit different. As a func and I argue as a function of an environment of which is so cleaved into two worlds of work, those who are able to bridge the divide leverage what I refer to in my study as in-betweenness. And that has both the social dimension in terms of ties and connectivity between uh, both the foreign born generation who sometimes might be family and close friends and uh, those in the front of the house who tended to be white and class privileged those who had ties to both uh, groups, as well as cultural familiarity with um, both uh, American, maybe LA specific cultural norms, were able to bridge these two worlds in a way that could be a source of tremendous advantage, uh, particularly because supervisors, who are oftentimes white and monolingual English, uh, would rely on these individuals uh, in order to help them bridge the very divide that I argue they helped to set up in the first place. So again, um, this became a source of advantage and uh, led to some second generation individuals in the study being able to uh, ascend um, into the supervisory ranks and get ahead within this environment. And so on that note, um, I welcome feedback from our discussant Jiyun and uh, audience as well. Thank you. All right, terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, Gion, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, I uh, also would like to thank Roger for inviting me uh, to be part of this lovely event and um, my warmest congrats to all the authors for the publication of um, the, their amazing first books. 
Well, whenever the graduate admission season comes around, uh, I usually find myself competing with uh, UCLA over the students that I want to recruit uh, to the University of Michigan. And it always puts me in such a tricky situation. Uh, I am really proud of my intellectual pedigree and I have this uh, special place uh, in my heart for Los Angeles and Southern California. So it's just very difficult uh, for me to argue against UCLA anyway. And of course, uh, the presence of a strong uh, contingent of faculty and graduate students coalescing around the Center for the Study of International Migration uh, often proves to be the most formidable challenge uh, to my own recruitment effort. And the scrub of new books uh, showcased today demonstrates uh, why this has been the case. But for today, uh, I'm gonna just take off my Wolverine hat and just to celebrate uh, the collective achievement of the UCLA Mafia in migration studies. So uh, the two books I was assigned to comment on uh, were both uh, great joys to read uh, and also um, empirically rich materials uh, and analytically sharp insights uh, presented in a very accessible and often evocative and savory prose. Uh, it turned out uh, that both books were based on long-term ethnographic research in Los Angeles and broader Southern California. Uh, and of course, before COVID, uh, making me all very nostalgic about the color and the fabric of life elsewhere some other time. In terms of the subject matter, uh, these two books are very different uh, with Tassin's book, focusing on uh, immigrant identity formation and group making from a transnational and global perspective. And uh, it lies on the making and remaking of inequalities through the everyday organization of work. I still would like to start with a couple of common threads uh, that connect the two books. So what struck me first uh, was that both books show uh, the clear imprint of the distinctive intellectual milieu uh, provided by the UCLA sociology department. One of the hallmarks uh, of the UCLA migration studies has been the rather cautious approach uh, to the so-called transnational turn that swept across the field in the last three decades while at the same time remaining quite critical of methodological nationalism in the field. And I'm of course thinking of Roger and David's AJS article on transnationalism in question. And of course, David's A Nation of Emigrants and Roger's uh, most recent synthesis, Cross-Border Connection. My own first book uh, that chose the term transborder instead of transnational also shows uh, the influence of this intellectual milieu that raised me. The multi-centered relational framework that Tassin uh, proposes uh, builds on this insight, taking seriously the territoriality of the host country that profoundly shapes migrant identity formation and political actions. But it also breaks a whole new ground by highlighting the surprising importance of elsewhere, the insight that other foundational frameworks in migration studies, such as assimilation, panethnicity, transnationalism, and diaspora couldn't quite capture. I also couldn't not notice uh, from Tassin's treatment of what she calls uh, exogenous shocks, uh, the influence of Roger Superbaker, uh, his sustained effort to theorize groupness as a variable rather than a constant, and especially his suggestion that we analyze groupness in relation to eventual, uh, eventful temporality. Eli's book, for its part, uh, builds on the long-standing inquiry on the matching between certain jobs and categorical differences, such as race, ethnicity, and gender, and the implications of such matching for the reproduction of durable inequality. Again, the influence of Rogers' earlier work, like Still the Promised City and How the Other Half Works is palpable, how network hiring practices, opportunity holding, and the cultivation of a particular dispositions and aspirations contribute to the formation of ethnic niches in urban America from the basis of the scaffolding of Eli's book. But in this book, he zeroes in uh, on the starkly divided words of work inside of one industry. He also highlights the heterogeneity of the jobs often lumped together as a homogeneous brown color occupation. What strikes me as an especially distinctive contribution of the book is the analysis of the temporal organization of work at the front and back of the house and its matching with the temporal orientation of each group of workers at a particular life stage with a distinctive future prospect and with the different levels of resources. In addition, uh, his careful attention uh, to the everyday life world in which Latino migrant workers are embedded 
and the micro interactions that unfold in quote unquote the social drama of the workplace associates his book with the work of uh, Ruben uh, Hernandez Leon and Jack Katz. The other common thread that stood out to me uh, is how unexpected uh, ethnographic findings, which stemmed from the author's long-term immersion in their respective field site, help them produce some of the most powerful and poignant aha moments of the respective book. In Tassin's case, the most uh, fitting examples would be the starkly different reactions of her research participants to the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe versus the Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh and to the ISIS terror attack in Paris versus the ISIS terror attack in Beirut. These contrasting reactions enable her to investigate which elsewhere matters to whom and why, highlighting how the resonance of elsewhere is critically mediated through the global geopolitics and its influence on the ethnopolitical landscape of the host society. Although these violent and tragic incidents were not under her control, the insight they produced, uh, that is the different valence of different elsewheres, led her to consciously recruit uh, Shia Muslim participants and compare which elsewhere matters to whom vis-a-vis -vis the majority of Sunni Muslims. The value of illuminating ethnographic moments comes out most powerfully in chapter two of Eli's book. He analyzes how workers that belong to the front and back of the house reproduce and retrench the distinction between themselves through everyday boundary work. He thoughtfully analyzes seemingly mundane facets of life, um, like who knows whose name, who speaks past whom, and with whom the kitchen staff share the so-called family meals, the meals intended for staff consumption only. These ethnography findings flesh out beautifully what institutionalized non-interaction looks like in the restaurant industry, where two groups of workers coexist while being worlds apart from each other. This insight also encourages him to consciously seek out exceptions like Latino servers, female chefs, and white college educated kitchen staff and investigate what difference made these people an exception and what difference they could make or could not make in this spatially, socially, and symbolically segregated workplace. So let me now just discuss the two books uh, one by one and ask two questions for each author along the way. I will start with the Tassins. The multi-centered relational framework she proposes is presented in this nice uh, diagram in page 40 of the book. As I examined this diagram and also read her analysis, I realized that the title of the book, uh, which is by the way, very catchy and awesome, can be still slightly misleading. The title captures multiple centers, but what Tassin is doing here is actually a lot more than simply adding elsewhere as another place of salience for immigrant identity categories. In fact, the arrows in this diagram in page 40 that denote uh, the relational aspect in this multi-centered relational framework are what's really important. It may not be too surprising that homeland conflicts or ev events happening somewhere else affect immigrant identities only through the mediation of the hostland politics. What I find truly illuminating, however, is her analysis in chapter three of how homeland conflicts, uh, in this case, Hindu-Muslim conflict in India and the rivalry between India and Pakistan get to affect uh, South Asian Muslim immigrants in California through the mediation of elsewhere, like the ISIS terror attacks or Syrian refugee crisis. That is, homeland cleavages come to matter not simply because immigrants bring these cleavages from the homeland as the diaspora framework would predict. These homeland cleavages matter or matter more or come to matter in different ways because they are refracted uh, through the dynamics and events elsewhere. And in this sense, uh, here, there, and elsewhere are not just the centers, but seem to operate more like prisms that filter and refract. I wonder if Tassin has thought about this metaphor or just uh, any other metaphors to capture this relational aspect better than simply calling them, uh, calling them centers. 
And second, uh, I appreciated uh, Tassin's thoughtful discussion on the generalizability of her theoretical framework in the concluding chapter of the book. She reviews how this framework might apply to diverse immigrant or non-immigrant minority groups in different regional and national contexts. But what I found missing uh, in this otherwise quite exhaustive coverage is how transposable her multi-centered relational framework would be uh, in the case of South-South migration or migration to non-Western countries. I would assume that despite the recent increase in migration from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India to the United States or other countries in the global north, these migrants constitute only a fraction of the migrants from these three countries. For example, Saudi Arabia uh, and other oil-rich countries in the Middle East, which appear as the prominent elsewhere in the book's analysis, host a lot more Muslim migrants from South Asia because of the shared religion and the opportunity to perform haji, and also because of their greater accessibility. Can I can I just continue? than uh, affluent liberal democracies in the West. Uh, what would here, there, and elsewhere dynamics look like for these Muslim migrants? I wonder uh, if Tassin can think with us about this question further and what we might get from this comparative experiment. And now let me just move to Eli. Uh, my first question is about what he calls a proximal service uh, and the exclusionary effect it has on Latino immigrant workers. By proximal service, he means a particular style of service that plays down distinctions between server and served. Um, servers are expected to act more like a peer than like the subordinary help. And this leads to a strong managerial preference for those who can display similar characteristics of the target clientele, namely use, whiteness, and upper middle classness. Eli effectively demonstrates how this service branding shapes the server training, dress codes at the restaurant floor, and practices of giving away food and drink items for free, a whole set of performances that Latino immigrant workers not equipped with the particular kinds of cultural capital would find extremely difficult to master. In the later chapter, Eli indeed introduces Enrique, uh, who had made a successful transition from a support worker to a restaurant manager and bartender, but eventually decide to give it up and bust the table again. For him, navigating affluent white space on an everyday basis proved too much to handle over the long run. He would be happier if he could simply say uh, adios, bye-bye to customers. Interesting for me, uh, this actually brought back the memory of how stressful it was to go to restaurants in my first few years at the graduate school. The pressure to engage in small chats uh, with servers was just really too much to handle for an international student coming from a very different culture of interaction and whose first language is not English. International students like me <clears throat> complained that in the United States, even sandwich stores like Subway want you to talk and customize your order. We really wished the server would just say adios, bye-bye, um, and just leave us alone. And this makes me wonder if Eli could say a bit more about if and how this exclusionary effect of the proximal service transpires in the server client interaction, and if it ever affects how front of the house workers see themselves despite the unstable working condition that they are subjected to. And the second question is, uh, well, predictably about the transnational dimension of the construction of the back of the house work, which seems to be a missing piece uh, in this otherwise thoroughly researched book. Eli demonstrates how the back of the house work is constructed as a quintessentially masculine job, enabling these predominantly male Latino workers to approach their work as long-standing commitment, despite limited economic rewards for doing so. I'm wondering if this is also the case in their origin countries, and if not, if they ever need to reconcile this difference in the gender coding of a given occupation. I'm asking this question with some knowledge that this is often the case for Asian immigrants for whom the kitchen space, including those in commercial establishment, is often marked as a feminine space uh, in their origin countries. 
Another transnational dimension that I want to ask about is not really about the past, like what they brought from the origin country, but about the future, what they want to bring back in case of return. Specifically, I am wondering whether the Latino immigrant workers who face immigrant ceilings in their occupation imagine their future career trajectories more transnationally. For example, do any of them talk about using these skills and experiences to open their own upscale restaurants back in their home countries? If so, does it make it more bearable to be stuck with a backbreaking labor in the kitchen uh, with very limited possibilities for promotion and financial improvement? Or does it make it more frustrating not to be given the opportunity to observe and learn how the restaurant as a business works as a whole? Or do they simply find their current job situation irrelevant to their future in case of return? So, okay, uh, this is it. Uh, I actually feel quite lucky about logging in uh, from Berlin because it seems like I am the only person uh, who will not be judged for uh, drinking a glass of wine just to be truthful to this festive um, spirit of the uh, occasion. Congratulations. Okay, so thank you so much, Jayun, for those terrific comments. So why don't we, uh, why don't we now give the authors a, a chance to respond and let's do so then in reverse order. So Eli, so we'd go then Eli, Tassim, David, uh, Rocio, and Laura. So if you're ready, Eli, do you wanna to respond to uh, Jayun's comments? Thank you, J.M., for your, your comments. Um, uh, really, your read on the book is sharper than I was able to describe myself. So um, I, <laughs> I, I appreciate that and uh, was taking notes uh, for future presentations. <laughs> um, your first question regarded uh, was regarding proximal service, which I describe as one of the three, I create kind of a typology of, of upscale service within restaurants. And I would argue this goes beyond restaurants to all types of hospitality uh, establishments, at least in the US. So proximal service, as you described, is this kind of peer-like, uh, almost chummy, casual service that um, is, a, I argue, kind of a specific product of managerial decisions, both hiring and uh, in terms of training. And um, as you would imagine, those who are best able to, so there, there needs, there's a close relationship between uh, the individuals hired uh, to work in a service capacity and the expected clientele precisely because there needs to be a parallelism, proxim social proximity. Uh, and as you stated, uh, Jayun, this does serve as a powerful mechanism that makes it, dissuades management from wanting to, um, from wanting to hire uh, or, or promote individuals who don't fit that. Now, what I argue is uh, maybe a little bit of a, an important nuance. Uh, the setting that I was within that most closely um, represented proximal service was a setting where trendiness and a kind of youthful vibe was very important to the ambiance of that establishment in the front of the house and for customers. Precisely because of that, some second generation Latino workers um, were able to capture that element that is perhaps less racialized and more premised on familiarity with youth culture, uh, particularly as it manifests in LA and maybe the west side, the, the beach cities, uh, which was the general area of, of this restaurant. And so um, it would be inaccurate to say that second generation LA born young uh, 20, 30 something uh, Latino workers uh, you know, were, were completely uh, excluded from these opportunities as a function of, of the racialized status of the job. There were other characteristics management looked for in order to achieve that social proximity um, that actually enabled some of them uh, to make that mobility jump. Um, but I agree with you uh, in broad strokes, this was another powerful mechanism of inequality for uh, the immigrant generation as well as, um, and so on and so forth there. Uh, but thank you for that question. Um, let's see, uh, there were a couple more, but just to be brief, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that you mentioned uh, this idea of kind of uh, circular migration, a kind of uh, upskilling and skill deployment in, in, um, in home country, um, you know, certainly reminds me of, of uh, my old advisor, Ruben hernandez Leon's work with uh, Jackie Higgin. Uh, I was not unfortunately able to really delve into this theme with, with sufficient empirical rigor. Unfortunately, um, might've been a bit of my own positionality and my sort of my myopic focus of what happens, um, what happened within the workplace. Um, I will though say that um, 
I, I'm thinking of some prominent examples that, that come to mind after all these years of Latino workers, uh, foreign born Latino workers who were deeply committed or became committed over time to, uh, to restaurant work. They derived important sources of their identity, masculinity, uh, sense of mentorship and loyalty to those mentors within the restaurant space. So while I certainly uh, acknowledge that they have many other deeply emotional and social ties to those, particularly back in, in the, excuse me, in the in home country, um, I also was sort of focusing more on the increasingly developed and uh, embedded ties within the restaurant and to people within that space. Um, so um, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. It's, it's certainly something that I would love to investigate in the future. It's, it's a fascinating question. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Tassim. Uh, thank you so much, Jayan, for that uh, very insightful reading uh, of my book um, and also for your uh, two great questions. Actually, your first question captures uh, the many, many months of struggle uh, that uh, I had to go through when I was writing the book. Um, so uh, it's interesting that you uh, offer uh, an alternative to centers uh, prisons which I have to say did not uh, occur to me to use exactly the word prisons, but what I was struggling with, what I was trying to really pin down was worldviews, uh, that these different immigrants based on their home, diverging homeland experiences, where they are located uh, in the host land, uh, and uh, their differing worldviews based on their political allegiances and many other factors uh, varied. Um, but then uh, the reason why I ended up using centers was uh, because even in these worldviews, not every place, not every point mattered equally. Uh, some faded over time because they were just responding to, to um, say, a passing trend um, on, on social media. Some uh, had more historical relevance to them that made it more salient. And some just had more valence because of the continuing uh, global inequality, uh, the, 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 the host land relationship with their, the ge geopolitical relationship with different centers that, that remained. So that's why I wanted to pin down even more from this ab sometimes abstract sense of worldview to specific points and wanted to interrogate how did these, did these places come to have this kind of salience? And uh, why do these different places uh, uh, vary uh, based on uh, different, um, uh, you know, homeland and elsewhere connections? So, um, for, you know, it, may, it only makes me wish that I had a conversation with you while I was writing this book, um, then I would have uh, probably had a more constructive uh, thought process there. But your second question about the uh, whether or how the elsewhere framework is generalizable to a South to South migration is something that I've been thinking about after my book has uh, been published. And I, the way that I'm thinking about it is that you are exactly right. That's even for Bangladeshi immigrants, there are so many Bangladeshis who go to these Gulf countries for um, uh, short term uh, um, job, uh, jobs and they have to come back. Um, and then many of them try to then go back, uh, not necessarily to the same country. They don't end up being in the same country. So one thing that I'm just thinking about right now is uh, what happens when they go to different countries for employment? What are the things that remain with them? Uh, how, do the, how do their worldviews change? Uh, does that have any kind of connection to different elsewheres uh, uh, popping up or some elsewheres waning in salience. So just some ideas that I have been thinking on my own um, after my book has been published. But this is something that I, I want to see uh, if the, gener uh, the elsewhere film is generalizable to that kind of migration and what that would look like. But I don't yet have any concrete answers for you. OK, thank you, David. Um, well, thank you, David, for the questions and uh, the close reading. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah, this is very much kind of an L.A. centric versus hometown centric uh, kind of story. And I think a lot of that is due to kind of time. 
uh, time and one in the sense that these are not kind of the immigrants depicted kind of in the work of Massey and others of come, coming from kind of village areas uh, with really tight networks uh, that then can reproduce in the US. This is more kind of the story that Ruben and others are talking about of migrants coming from more kind of urban areas with uh, kind of more fluid ties, uh, more flexibility in terms of uh, who they might network with. Uh, but it's also a story of time as a lot of these men that I met in the park have been in the US 10, 20, 30 years. So maybe even if they had come over with these tight networks, over time they grew apart and the park became a place where they created new ties. So if I had met them kind of in day one, it might have been a very tight kind of hometown connection, but over time, you know, life happens and they created new friends uh, through the park and other areas. Uh, three, and of course, present company excluded, maybe we have maybe even previously have maybe overstated uh, kind of the degree of the hometown connections reproducing in the US and maybe not seeing, even as you mentioned, when in the hometown teams you were studying, there might've been a Honduran on the team there, you know, and so forth. And uh, to kind of give an extreme example of the amount of guy, white guys that showed up at the park and said, oh, wow, I just thought it was a bunch of Mexicans to realize there's Peruvians and Brazilians and Salvadorans, you know, uh, is kind of a caricature maybe of that view. Um, and also kind of the story of the second generation is interesting and they certainly have a lot more opportunities, but I was struck, especially the sons and their friends, by how still connected they were to the park, uh, despite that they had a lot of opportunities to do things elsewhere. Now these men are now, you know, in their thirties, they have families and they still kind of go back to the park and really shows kind of the pull of this park uh, kind of beyond, you know, exclusion elsewhere. Now, that being said, I very much like the metaphor you mentioned of a cage that very much a lot of what they're creating in the park is due to exclusions they face elsewhere. So absolutely, that is right. Maybe I should have thought of using the cage as well as a metaphor for the park. Uh, but the park also became a place to combat uh, some of that exclusion and create other opportunities. Uh, but the real issue is that for most outsiders, they didn't see these exclusions, especially the park neighbors, but also maybe family members, all wondering why are these men drinking in the park? Why are they always in this park? Uh, why can't they drink at home? Why can't they um, you know, uh, go to bars or, you know, to, to follow Eli's work. Why are there so many men here on Mondays? It's the first day of the work week. What's going on? Well, it's because a lot of them worked in restaurants. And as Eli knows, often restaurants are closed on Monday. So the key thing is, and that's the goal of ethnography is for a lot of outsiders, they didn't understand any of these exclusions. And because it didn't necessarily mesh with their everyday life, they saw it as deviant and as problematic. Uh, but I definitely, and Putnam, I think you would have had a mixed feeling about what's going on in this park uh, as well. So, uh, but thank you very much. Okay, terrific. Thank you, and Rocio. Thank you, David, for your comments. Although one of your questions gave me a little bit of uh, UCLA PTSD with the, what is this a case of? Um, I guess I still, it's still a trigger for me uh, since we often got that question when we were grad students. Uh, your second question, how transportable are these networks? Will perhaps give me uh, help, you know, guide, guide us to an answer to the first. I'm always um, amazed how readers connect or how researchers who are reading the book connect what they're seeing in their own work and field sites to the ethnic cage. And the two more recent, uh, among another recent, uh, in another recent uh, talk that I gave, two researchers approached me to talk about their own work. One was focusing on uh, Korean shopkeepers, uh, first generation and second generation children of Korean shopkeepers. And they saw in that dynamic essences of the ethnic page where children themselves sometimes felt like they were being exploited by their parents. And so they, in their research could appropriate, you know, the, the concept from this book to make sense of what they were seeing, which, you know, again, is another instance of like an immigrant, a first generation immigrant case. The second uh, researcher who I met talked about his own research in a Hasidic community and how because of the bounded nature of that community, they could both receive benefits, but also have exploitative conditions. And so now you see another case where it's not necessarily immigrant status, but a religious community that is creating the cage around um, community members. 
And so I think we really have to think about the obligations that people feel compelled or the obligations that people have to each other. And sometimes as in the case of Ruteros, those obligations are bro born out of paisanaje. But in other contexts, those obligations are born out of a religious affiliation or born out of a familial obligation. And so I think in terms of how transportable are these networks or this concept of the ethnic cage, we really have to think of all the ways that we have obligations to community members, all the constraints that we have that are not only a result of precarity, but also a result of the benefits that are provided to us by those community members. And so we don't often think of the beneficial aspects of social networks as a constraint, but as I show in the book, they can be, right? Because when you choose to walk away from an exploitative community, you're also choosing to walk away from the benefits that that community provides on its better days. And so both the benefits and the exploitation can serve as a reason to stay. Um, you know, the other thing, the, the, another question that I often get from um, audience members is you know why why don't these people just leave or get another job when they're being exploited for, from workers and and what I often counter with is like how often we stay in situations that are not good for us whether it's a problematic relationship we have an, we have with an employer or with a significant others there are lots of reasons that people opt to stay in situations that are not ideal and so I think uh, you know the the how transportable is, net, is networks can can be, the, the concept rather, can be applied to different types of relations and different types of formulations to explain why given all the circumstances, people don't walk away from a situation that doesn't seem to be in their best interest. And so uh, I hope that kind of kind of loops around and answers the question of what is this a case of? Like uh, this, this might be a case of people opting to stay when all the situations seem to hint that life elsewhere might be better. And so under what circumstances do people stay in a community when exploitative uh, tendencies emerge? And so I'm hoping that that's the way that this concept can kind of be, can, can be re replicated across communities and, and hopefully get some traction um, in the coming years. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay, terrific. So why don't we have a little time, Let, I'm going to give the, Permission to talk to Jacob Thomas, a member of the UCLA diaspora now in Princeton. Jacob, you want to pose your question and quick responses from authors? Sure. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Oh, let me, can I turn on my camera? I guess I can't. It doesn't allow me. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so I'll just ask it like this. So um, my question actually just sort of follows up on what Rocio was saying, um, a question I was going to pose to Eli. Um, and it comes, um, uh, to like, I get that I just got the impression while I was in LA that a lot of these, what you call conventionally attractive restaurant servers are actually um, also, this is just their day job and they're aspiring actors and actresses due to the flexibility offered by the, such jobs and they want to audition and uh, have that flexibility in their schedule. But in contrast, a lot of the immigrant laborers at the back of the house may have less outside options in the broader labor market due to their uh, immigration status. So I was thinking, you know, um, that kind of um, uh, lack of outside option is going to perhaps constrain their autonomy in the workplace. And so I was wondering how you think about the, that worker autonomy for both types of workers comparatively, especially now as we see a lot of restaurant workers complain that they're having difficulty finding enough workers, but they're hesitant to raise wages, so they're trying to attract and sign up, sign up bonuses and so forth. So kind of what, what, what you would say to those sort of employers. Okay, excellent. All right, Eli, we have yeah. a few minutes. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jacob, for, uh, and uh, good, to, good to see you virtually again. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's, a, you raise a, a few fascinating points. Um, one thing I do want to mention, mention which is, which is a, a large part of, of um, one of the chapters that I have yet, have not really discussed that much, is what is the appeal of restaurant jobs, front of the house restaurant jobs to um, white, relatively privileged uh, young workers, both men and women. And another way to phrase that is why do middle class uh, men and women take working class jobs? I mean, it's sort of an odd puzzle. 
Um, and what I argue is that these are not just wages for them. These are lifestyle jobs that appeal to both their um, labor interests. You mentioned flexibility, part-time jobs, but also their um, broader set of tastes and interests. These are people who like to patronize these establishments themselves as consumers. Management knows this. <laughs> and management oftentimes goes to very calculated extents to set up front of house jobs uh, to attract these types of individuals. So, um, you know, if your question or some, some version of your question was, you know, sort of why are, why are they in this capacity, at least pre-COVID, uh, that was um, part of the story, part of the analysis that I, I brought to the table. Um, I, another, it, that also segues to a, a kind of irony that I found uh, emerged in the data, which is that some of the, some of the workers in restaurants that are most committed to, um, to staying in restaurants, to learning these skills, uh, being loyal to uh, their bosses and to the restaurant itself, were those who were least likely to experience upward mobility and access positions of authority. Uh, that is people, uh, immigrant workers in the kitchen and also in lower level uh, front of house jobs, what I call sur uh, support jobs. So um, those who are most sort of flighty in ways that I'm sure you remember thinking about, at least stereotypically in LA, uh, those front of house servers and bartenders um, were the ones who were given access to the best quality jobs, at least in terms of wages and prestige might be concerned. Uh, so there was a deep irony there, um, but I would, I, I would argue, and I, I don't, I don't want to um, mislead anybody, what is anchoring this system in place is decisions that management makes about who are they trying to structure into what position uh, and the kinds of embodied attributes um, that sort of anchor these uh, divided worlds of work um, uh, apart from one another. But thank you for the question. Okay, well, that, that's a very thoughtful uh, note on which to, to bring this session to an end. But before I do that, a few words of thanks. First of all, I, uh, I want to thank Sofia Angeles, who is the graduate student assistant, who has made uh, this program possible from the beginning of the year to the end. And Sofia has done a great job, and I want to express uh, our deep appreciation for everything that you've done to make this possible. Uh, I want to thank David for the terrific colleagueship and uh, in, in coordinating this uh, activity all year long. It's been enjoyable and satisfying and I think very productive. And of course, thanks to the authors and commentators. And it's a terrific pleasure to be able to celebrate your wonderful accomplishments and to engage in this dialogue. I'm sorry we couldn't do so in person, but circumstances are such that requires this remote encounter. But I think it's been intellectually very satisfying and engaging. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, a uh, celebration in person uh, in Los Angeles at uh, ASA 2022. So with all that, thanks also to our audience for participating all year, year long. Have a good summer, everyone. Stay healthy, of course, and looking forward to seeing you in the next academic year. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>